Teresa Paul. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Detective Walker, I think where we left off yesterday, um, I was asking, when we were talking at some point, about whether or not you were able to um, I'm sorry, hold one moment. I was asking you, um, I think yesterday, uh, if you happened to hear a phone call between Mr. Malazza and his wife, Sean. Yes, I did. Okay. Also, is that the phone call, um, a portion of the phone call that you've heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And a little bit later in that phone call, does he also say that I, um, to her, I just asked you to put my clothes out or put my clothes up? Yes, he does. And then do you also hear him say, um, it was my clothes, um, put me out of the house, where else am I clothes supposed to go? Yes, he does. Okay. So I also was asking you, I think yesterday, um, you were talking about some of the, um, I guess, items that you sent off for, um, I guess, you know, collected and or sent off for testing. Did you recall that? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you remember um, the items that you start with collected? Yes, I did. Okay. Tell us um, what you collected and what you um, had sent off for testing. Uh, we first, uh, obviously at the scene, had collected a shell casing and an autopsy, a projectile from Jonathan Price. And those items were taken to the Kentucky State Police Lab um, for examination. Also, um, the swabs from Jonathan Price uh, that were collected um, at autopsy, in addition to swabs of uh, Jonathan Price's wedding ring. Uh, the, I spoke yesterday about swabbing Megan Price at her mother's home um, during a meeting on the 23rd of June. Um, those items were all taken to the State Police Laboratory to be examined. Uh, in addition, 
Jonathan Price's clothing were collected, including his boots. And the clothing I discussed yesterday, I collected Megan Price's clothing at the hospital on the 21st of June. Those items I also took to the state police lab. Was also um, Jonathan's shirt sent to um, Lawrence Culture at the lab to do some distance determination on there? Yes, it was. Um, and then I think you also mentioned buckle swabs from um, both Mr. Canada and Mr. Malaz, correct? That's correct. I collected those from the two defendants, and those were also um, taken to the state police lab. And then I think you mentioned, oh, you said that, the wedding ring. Jonathan clothes, Megan's clothes. And was there also, um, a request for the swabs of Reyes' car to be processed as well? Yes. There were three items, I believe, that were sent from Reyes. The search warrant that was, um, you heard from Detective Eden, um, who was a detective that processed that car. Those items that were collected or the swabs that were collected from uh, Reyes' Hudson's vehicle were sent to the state police lab. And also um, the gun that was ultimately um, recovered from ATF, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. Did you, uh, we had talked about, uh, I guess, the cell numbers for Mr. Canada and Mr. Malaza. Um, were you at any point able to, um, you got a search warrant for Mr. Canada's phone record, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and then ultimately, at some point, were you able to get Mr. Malazan's phone? Yes, I was. All right. And then was that given to Computer Forensic Services for uh, forensic analysis? It was, yes. <clears throat> Judge, at this point, I would move to introduce Yes, I believe on the second, I learned that it was recovered from Antonio Fry, September. And Mr. Fry is African American, right? Yes, he is. He's approximately five foot ten. Yes. And I think you can verify that on the page. Actually, four. I believe that he's taller than five foot ten. Okay, uh, if you check out page four or five of your notes. Okay. When you spoke earlier, my, my pages are not numbered, I believe, like they are in Discovery. Um, At some point, did you pull some booking information from Mr. Pratt? Um, I 
I don't know if I have. I know what you're referring to is uh, booking information. I have seen that, yes. Okay. And on there, it indicated that his height was 70 inches. I'm aware that that's what it says on that, that document. Okay. I've been uh, told that that's not exactly correct. You've been told, but that's the document you have, right? That's, I believe that's what it says on that document, okay. yes. And he's stocky built. He is stocky, yes. And you indicated on direct something about trying to communicate with Mr. Fry. Did you speak directly to him? No, I didn't. Um, I was notified about the purchase of that gun on September the 2nd. And like I testified on September the 4th, that gun was released out of the custody of the ATF into the Lexington Police custody. Um, and their discussions began at that point uh, regarding our desire to speak to Mr. Fry to determine the, the path in which that, that firearm came into his possession. Um, we. We're con we contacted the United States Attorney's Office, who was prosecuting that case for the ATF, uh, in addition to obviously speaking to uh, Special Agent Doug Robinson and, and his partner, um, and the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, um, in an effort to have a collaborative effort to bring Mr. Fry to the table to find out this information. Um, that was all in the works to happen, and Mr. Fry refused to uh, provide any type of statement to the police or the, the, the federal uh, law enforcement agency that had charged him in regards to the information. So what you're indicating here today is that there were emails and conversations between you and the U.S. Attorney's Office, right? There were definitely conversations, yes. Okay, and none of that was documented in any of your reports? Well, that, that was a conversation taking place between Doug Robinson and myself okay, so and the other, other agent that was involved in the seizure of that firearm. So these conversations were most likely between you and Doug Robinson and another agent? And, and the prosecuting attorney at the federal prosecutor's office. None of this was documented. Uh, at that point, no conversations had been taken or reported and taken place with the defendant. Uh, we were trying to get the logistics of bringing that defendant to the table so we could get that information from him. Unfortunately, due to his unwillingness to speak with us, him being uh, Mr. Fry, that conversation never took place. So there was really nothing to document at that okay. point. And so Mr. Fry has been in federal custody for approximately four years at this time? Uh, yes, ma'am. And at no point have you had any direct contact with Mr. Fry? I have not, no. And you've not gotten a warrant to get a sample of his DNA? I have not, no. So you do not know if the DNA recovered from under Jonathan Price's fingernails belongs to Mr. Fry? Uh, no, I don't have a sample of Mr. Fry's DNA, but at this point there's no reason to believe that uh, Mr. Fry was at that location of the homicide. You didn't put his photo in the lineup to present to Megan Price. Uh, I didn't put his, anyone's photo in a lineup to present to Megan Price. Okay. And no photo lineup with um, Mr. Fry was presented to Jessica Hansford. Uh, no, it wasn't. Again, we had no reason to believe that Mr. Fry uh, was present um, at the time that the homicide occurred on June the 21st. Um, we did know that uh, the ATF had purchased this Springfield Armory handgun that we spoke about from him some two and a half months after this homicide. And it's in, it's in, in my experience, a, a stolen gun that obviously has been used in a crime changes hands many, many times very quickly after that uh, crime or theft even has occurred. And there was no evidence to support Mr. Fry even being at the scene of the crime when the murder happened. So again, back to my question, so you didn't put his photo in the lineup to present either to Shane Hansford or to Mitchell Smith either? No, there was no reason to do that. Okay, you didn't gather his cell phone data, did you? No. <laughs> and you didn't try to see if he was present in a silver car in Woodville that night? We had no video of Mr. Fry in a silver car in Woodhill that night. Um, at some point, you also interviewed <coughs> Antonio Taylor, right? 
Yes, ma'am. And Antonio Taylor is another African American male with dreadlocks. Yes, he does have dreadlocks. He's considerably younger than the defendant candidate. How old is he? Antonio Taylor, uh, his birthday is April the 16th of 1995. As opposed to um, Mr. Canada, who was born in you what has been marked for identification as Defense Exhibit 9. Do you recognize that picture? Uh, I don't know when this picture was taken. Um, again, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily be able four years later to say that that's Antonio Taylor. Uh, do you have the, the document showing his name? I'm just asking you if you recognize I don't that recognize is. the picture, no. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Took it into evidence, but did not analyze it. Uh, I, I looked through his phone. It wasn't forensically uh, downloaded, no. So on direct, you indicated that you had somewhat of a vague description of an individual uh, when you were investigating the Austin City shooting, right? That's correct. So the description was of a black male, medium to dark skin, with dreadlocks wearing a white shirt. Age uh, 26 to 32, with a medium to dark complexion. And do you know how many men were present in Woodhill, the Woodhill area that night who matched that description? Of course, I have no way of knowing that. You did, however, as you said, collect some surveillance from Portland's, right? Yes, ma'am. And you had an officer review that to determine if there was anyone who matched that vague description. Yes. Like I discussed, in the beginning of the investigation, um, we, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Mrs. Price provide us with the description that was just provided. Um, not having any more information than that at that particular time, um, we, we did what makes sense and tried to gather as much information uh, to, to document individuals matching that description as possible. Uh, what made sense at that time was to look at the video in the area uh, to see if, if individuals matching that description were, were seen. So, Detective, you collected this video, someone reviewed it, and at 12.35, of course, the shooting occurred, there was an individual who matches the description. Yes. And that 
And that individual is... Meaning that he has the same bank description as uh, mm -hmm. Mrs. Price had provided. I understand. And that individual is seen getting into a silver SUV, right? Yes, ma'am. And nowhere on that video do you see Juan Mulan interacting with that individual. No, there, there's, there was no evidence that was revealed that that subject was defendant Canada either. Okay. Well, actually, you interviewed Ms. <coughs> Hayden, right? Yes. Case. And Miss um, Hayden is a friend of Mr. Canada's. She is. And when you showed her that video, she identified the individual at 1235 gave the silver SUV as Mr. Canada. Well, she also said that she identified him by his hairstyle and she also provided a second name that it, of an individual that it could have been, also based on just the hair side. Actually, Detective, it was you in the second interview on August 8th with Mrs. Gate who suggested to her that maybe she was mistaken and the person she saw could have been someone named Ron Al Suter, right? Yes, and that, that name had been provided by another individual that was um, interviewed. Okay, so after suggesting to her that it was someone named Ron Al Suter, um, you then continued your investigation, right? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't recall suggesting that to her. I, I think that she was very clear that that she had stated the names that she did based on the 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 hair length and the hairstyle in the video. So she thought, according to your testimony today, it could be either Ryan Suter or Quincy Canada in that video. Yes. All right, you did not interview Ronald Sewer in this case, did you? No, ma'am. You did not gather his DNA? No, ma'am. And you did not put him in any of the lines, did you? No, ma'am. There was no evidence further to support that Ron L. Suter was A, in the video, um, and there was no further evidence to support that Ron L. Suter was involved in any type of crime. The, the potential for Ron L. Suter to be possibly seen on the Thornton's video an hour before uh, the homicide doesn't indicate that he's he's done anything wrong or been involved in any type of crime. Or according to your interview with Ms. Hayden, who was also possibly Mr. Canada on the video an hour before the crime. Sure, and if there's no video of Thornton's that indicates or where a crime's been committed, again, at that point in time, before we had all the evidence that has been collected at this point, we were going solely on the information that we had uh, being the description. So we're talking about right now um, what was going on very early on in this investigation. And, and at that point, again, like I discussed yesterday, we were casting this wide net, um, just working on the, the vague information that we had in the beginning. So again, your interview with Ms. Hayden was August 8th. Yes. And you did not, at that point, take any steps to try to interview Mr. Sutter? No, no ma'am. Again, there was no information that he was involved in the crime. Um, you indicated that you had uh, Detective Barber go to various locations and collect surveillance for you, right? Yes, ma'am. Detective, I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 10 for identification. Do you recognize that document? <coughs> uh, yes, this is a, a map of Lexington uh, of the, the Wood Hill area. <coughs> And indicated on that map, are those the locations that you asked uh, Detective Barber to try to collect surveillance from? Uh, yes, it looks like um, there's a pin on the street for Ryan Circle, one for Hannah Place, which is a, another street in Lexington, uh, one at Lowe's, and then one at the location in which um, 
the extended stay hotel would be located. Okay. And then there's another one right next to it. I, I assume that that pin was for the car wash that's adjacent to um, the extended stay. Right. Uh, defense would move to Okay, so it's been marked for, uh, as Defense Exhibit 11 for identification. And who prepared this document? I did. Okay. So when we're looking at this document, this document just um, to see the distance, um, to determine the distance that uh, you see the, a vehicle traveling from the drive through um, of the Danny Scott Liquor Store, which is where it starts, yes, and then to where the vehicle um, in the Mariana Tienda video goes out of sight down on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, so. What I did is I went out there with a tool to measure distance, and I just measured the distance on the red lines uh, to get an uh, estimated distance of, of travel to, between those two points. So this point right here, this is approximately where you can see headlights on the Mariana's Tienda video posted here. Uh, approximately, yes. And then here is where that car disappears from view completely. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> now, over here, you can kind of see there are, as you're going through the Dan Scott liquor, you can't just drive straight out, can you? That's correct. There are some barriers in the parking lot that force you out of the drive through to the right. To the right. Towards okay. uh, the direction indicated there. You can also see on this map they've got a they've got like a directional line in the parking lot too. I right? do see that, yes. Turning the car that direction. Now the path that you've drawn on this map, that is not the only way to get in and out of this parking lot, is it? From the Danny Scott Liquor. The only way to get into what parking lot? In and out of this parking lot. From the Danny Scott Liquor Store, uh, I don't, I, you could drive around the building, I guess. Okay, so one option is the path you've documented, which goes down here, goes down, and around the building. That, that's yeah. correct. Okay, one option is just to turn and go this way, right? <coughs> oh, but you asked to get into the parking lot of... I'm in and out of the parking lot. Oh. Of course, there's there are several different entrances and exits. Yes. Okay. Um, another option is to drive like this, right? To exit out back onto Woodhill Drive. Yep. Or to Codell, which is over here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, defense would move to enter Exhibit Number <coughs> One. Now we've had an opportunity to review in the courtroom the Green Scott liquor store video, right? Yes, ma'am. So in that video, there's a cashier working the drive-through, obviously. There is. And she is the person who hands whatever item is sold to the person driving the Chevy Malibu. That's correct. Okay. 
So she is in a position to tell in more detail what that individual driving the car looks like, isn't she? At that particular time, potentially, yes. And she would be able to tell whether there was a passenger in the vehicle. Yes, but at the time, on, on, on June the 21st, um, we, we weren't aware that that pat car had passed through the drive through liquor store. I understand. So, um, by the time we received that video, I'm sure that that clerk has had thousands of customers come through the drive through Okay. But she was in a position to observe, one, whether there's a passenger, right? She had the opportunity to, oh, yes. She had the opportunity to observe whether that passenger was male or female? She would, yes. White or black? Yes. And if there was a passenger even there? Again, yes. At no point was that person from Gates Scott Liquor Store interviewed, watching. She was not, no, due to the time lapse of finding that video and uh, after we identified or, or noticed great similarities between your client and the person in the silver car in the drive-thru, um, I believe that it was better to have her, him identified by his own sister. Okay, but so you didn't bother to try to speak to the person who worked at the <coughs> No, we didn't go back and re-interview her that, at that what, particular time. But not re-interview, you didn't interview. Or interview her, yes. We spoke uh, uh, to her husband, I believe, um, when during our initial contact with them the day of the homicide in an effort to obtain the video. So there were photo lineups prepared during the course of this case, right? Yes. And you never asked Megan Price to review a photo lineup, did you? I asked Megan Price if she had the ability to identify the suspect that she was confronted by and, and she didn't feel like she was a, would be able to do that. And as you said, she was only able to describe one of the suspects, right? She definitely provided a much greater description of the suspect that was medium to dark complected with dreadlocks wearing the white shirt, 16 to 32 years age, because that's the individual that confronted her directly while the other one was confronting her husband. Um, so I won't say that she didn't have the opportunity to describe the second one at all, but definitely not to the extent that she did the first. Okay, so she provides the greater description in your words of the individual dreadlocks. Yes, because that's the suspect that she had the opportunity to see the most. In that greater description, she does not mention no, she does not. Um, and I believe that she, the reason, kind of, the, you asked earlier if I showed her a lineup, and we discussed her ability to identify a suspect out of a lineup, and she described to me how when she was confronted. Why right, should we approach? When she stated that, we were talking about the, the complexions of the individuals, the suspects in this crime. And she stated that the second individual was either very dark complected or wearing a mask. Like as if insinuating the fact that he was very dark complected. Well, what she said was either dark complected or she said could have been wearing a mask. That is correct. And you testified on direct that all she thought she saw was the barrel of the gun for the second suspect, right? That's what she said in the very first interview. And uh, the day, the, the first time that I talked to her right after she had been shot. Yes. And then on June 30th, she told you that she couldn't be certain whether both men actually had guns. That is correct. She was clear, though, that the gun pointed at her was a silver sign. She was very clear about that, yes. So by 
by mid-July, you had Guam laws in the city of Canada as suspects. Yes, ma'am. And at that point, the video of the shooting itself couldn't confirm the identity of the shooters. Are you you're referring to the Mariana Tienda yes. video? That the identity of the shooters is that what yep. your question was? Yes, it could not confirm the identity of the shooter. And Megan couldn't make an ID. That was clear. That's correct, also. So approximately a month after Mr. John Price was killed, the case had not been closed. That's correct, and the investigation continued. And this was a summer with a number of high-profile murders, right, or a number of murders. I don't know how you distinguish high-profile murders with non-high-profile murders, and I think there were 19 homicides that year. And quite a number of them occurred over that summer. Summer. Um, I, I don't know the dates of them, but oftentimes, uh, as a homicide detective, um, the summertime is a time when a majority of the homicides take place. Uh, very busy investigating this case, yes. Um, according to your testimony, you're saying that on, I believe, June 26th, you learned what uh, gun the casing from the scene possibly came from. That's correct. A Springfield 45 uh, Model XDX. And then you found out that there was a robbery involving two black males in Balding. The uh, we did, and a little better description than just two black males, but yes. And that was your case, it was detective about church, right? That is correct. So I'm assuming you guys communicated about the fact that this gun showed up in your case and a stolen SDS uh, was taken in his case. Absolutely. And so then detective about church goes down with the photo lineups to Somerset. Uh, yes, eventually he made contact with the victims in his robbery case and presented the lineups to the victims in that case. He brought the casings back and he gave them, he put them in evidence and you got them, right? Uh, yes, I believe I transported them to the lab the following day, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so the next day you took them to the lab and you got an answer that same day in regards to those casings matching the casing that was collected at Austin City, yes. So, it wasn't until early that September that you learned about Antonio Fry being in possession of the stolen gun, right? September the 2nd, when the ATF made a purchase of that firearm, yes. And no other stolen items were covered in this case. No purse, no credit cards, no wallet, right? That is also correct. And it was approximately December of 2014, 2014 excuse me, when you got the DNA results from Give me one second, please. What which DNA results are you referring to? The ones. The hat or. And what was the date that you asked? Uh, December 2014. Um, the lab report that I'm looking at has a July 23rd date on it. Do you have the one that you're referring to? I don't have it in front of me right okay. now, but I'm assuming so the, the DNA results that you got from the lab, that's the one that you're referring to. 
would come after you got a double swab from Mr. Caleb and Mr. Lawson. That's correct. That, that, that was the preliminary, uh, that was yeah. the evidence that we just took up initially, yes. Okay. So it wasn't until later after that, after you'd already seen your bubble swabs, that you got the results regarding their bubble swabs and the DNA on the ground crisis. Is it a December 16th day? Yes. Yes. And at that time, you did not take any steps, as we said, to interview Mr. Fry, right? Uh, we took great steps to interview Mr. Fry, except he denied to be interviewed. You never spoke to Mr. Fry yourself, did you? I, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to interview Mr. Fry. Again, um, many different law enforcement agencies and prosecutors' offices were attempting to bring Mr. Fry to the table, and he simply refused to have that conversation. Detective, are there occasions where you go to jail when you know individuals are incarcerated that are suspects in cases? Absolutely. And you interview them, right? At that point, Mr. Fry would have been represented by legal counsel, he, and he'd already told us that he did not want to want to wish to remain a, uh, silent on on that topic of the gun. He was represented by legal counsel on separate federal charges, and you never spoke directly to Mr. Fry or his attorney. No, on, I don't know about on separate legal charges because I'm talking about the path of the gun that he came into possession of that gun. Steps to talk to him or his attorney. I mean, not steps. You never talked to him or his attorney. No. And again, you didn't put him in any photographs. I had no reason to believe that he was there at the time of the homicide. I had reason to believe that he had sold a stolen gun two and a half months after the homicide. And you never took a sample of his DNA. No, ma'am. Even if that would definitely exclude him. He's not a suspect in my case. He wasn't, he wasn't, we had no information to believe that he was at that location that night. I understand, except for the fact that he was found in possession of the stolen firearm that you believe to be the murder right? Two and a half months later, yeah. Further questions? Well, I think when I go back, I'll be a lot of my questions. So, I don't know if I'll have this in. I'm sure nobody's going to have this in. I'm sure nobody's going to have this in. I'm sure nobody's going to have this in. So, 21st, this happens. You get called into work, sounds like 3 in the morning, when you weren't already down at the office or anything like that, right? That's correct. I would have been at off duty when I got called out. You're presented with this situation and you're doing the best you can to collect as much information as you can, gather as much information as you can, and work from the scene of the crime out to figure out what happened. Yes, sir. Right. And I'm talking about the morning of the day. We don't have any information from outside sources. We don't have, you know, there's no video or nothing yet. All we have is, you know, this price there who's talking to you. Know, and your, your team of investigators that was shooting all that, that you go out and collect the evidence, right? And that's correct. We, we were able, luckily, to get the Mariana Tienda video very quick in the investigation. Right. And that was a hidden video in general. That was a high priority. I mean, you guys wouldn't pay us for video that day, right? Yes, like I discussed yesterday, um, that video is evidence that can go away after time, so that always is a priority to, to collect that as soon as possible. Sure, and video evidence is what it is. It's not subject to somebody's uh, a witness's bias or what they, you know, what they had going on that day or recollection of videos. Just that, it's a video, right? So that's why it's good evidence. That is correct. Okay, and even beyond that day, you continue to collect video and send it to take the partner out to collect video. And that's, a, that's a staple of any murder investigation, obviously, if it's, if it's present. Yes, sir. Okay. 
FSU was called to the scene at 9 p.m. Uh, as we've already seen it here, they took a lot of pictures of the scene. Um, you, you know, um, you're an FSU detective now, is that right? That's correct. Okay. So you know the theory behind what they were calling the establishing shot, and then maybe move in a little bit closer and get a little bit more of a closer view of something, and then you move in to get the specific. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And that was done in this case. Um, pretty thorough. Uh, we saw pictures that they took of uh, all cars in the parking lot and um, license plates in there, just in case. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the information that we've seen on the night of, and we know it was good information, um, was that the suspects uh, left by way of going, as been described as going towards New Circle and then back down around and see signs and around the back, right? That's where they're, that's where both Megan Price indicated that they had fled after the scene, after the homicide, and that was also confirmed by the Mariana Tienda video. Exactly. So Megan pulled to that the day of, and we know she was right. right. Correct. Okay. And that, you know, it's been described <coughs> as going towards New Circle, and I think that's really because, you know, Megan said that they were facing Austin City, so New Circle would have been directly behind them, right? That's also correct. Okay. So, as you mentioned, the um, what I called back down around behind this building, that was searched, right? Yes, it was. And it was searched a couple different times. There was a canine run through there, people went down there looking for evidence, you went down through there, correct? That is correct. Okay. There wasn't any pictures taken back there, right? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. And then, on, at the time, um, the information that you had was that these people were on foot. Right. Megan said that they left jogging or walking around. Right? They left on foot. Right. For the period of time that they were seen, yes. Right. No one <coughs> saw them get into a vehicle. On the night of, nobody no. saw them get into a vehicle. No, sir. Okay. It's now subsequent that that's the theory because of the videos, correct? But at the time of, Nobody was saying, I saw them get into some type of car and drive off, or some type of SUV and drive off, or some type of anything. It was just, they went on foot that way, right? That is correct. They fled towards New Circle, and then it was confirmed that they uh, turned behind the shopping center. Okay. And so we have this really big map. Um, so it's a good uh, Down this way. So this right here, I'm trying to get out of the way. A car can get from this point right here, going over here, out of this parking lot without having to double back. That's correct. They okay. can drive them back in the shopping center. They can go around this way, and this is all street that's drivable, and go out that way, right? That's correct. Or they can go around this way and go out that way. That's also correct. Or they could even come around this way, go back through here, and go out that way. That's also correct. Right. This is all, like, the point I'm trying to make is this is all driving area. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And sometimes there's cars parked back here, right? I would, you could park a car back there. You could yes. park a car back there. And there's businesses back here too, right? There's businesses that actually front the back. There right? are. There's a daycare back there that I'm aware of. Okay. Do you know of any um, passageways through the fence line right here? With this, now we see this apartment complex here. Uh, do you know of any... Halfway, and we see that this is, you know, 2016, so th this may right. not be representative of the night of. But are you aware, do you remember any, not, not vehicle passage, mind you, but foot passage for Yeah, I, I do, I do, I am aware of the fact that there was a, I, I believe that the officers were referring to it as a cut through um, from that service road, we'll call it, and back of the shopping center to the apartments. Um, adjacent to the rear of the shopping center. Okay. Despite, besides that, do you know any more cut that were back there? I, I do not know. Okay. Now, when the call goes out, <coughs> so this is before you're on scene, but when the call goes out like this for shooting um, a perimeter set, can you tell the jury kind of what that's about? Yes, when a, when a call of this nature goes out, of course, the first responding officers are going to respond to the scene and provide aid to the victims um, and make sure that emergency care 
the fire department, ambulances um, are safe to come and, and, and uh, provide aid. Um, if a suspect description can be obtained, um, like it was in this case, that would be broadcasted over the police radio and a perimeter around that area would, would be set up um, in an effort to contain a potential suspect um, within that area and so that a, a search could, if a search was uh, able to be completed, it would prevent that person from getting outside in theory. Okay. Outside um, the perimeter, rather. Right. And so I don't know much about setting up perimeters, but it seems like it might be difficult on this particular scene because it was right next to New Circle Road. Um, is, it, is it still possible to set up a perimeter in that kind of circumstance, or does that make it trickier? Or? I mean, I, I don't know if it makes it trickier. I mean, you could essentially park a police car on New Circle Road, and, and they could see uh, it'd be obvious if someone would cross the road at that point. Gotcha. So, a suspect could leave a, a crime scene in any number of places, in three ounces and three seconds, whatever egress they find. On foot. On foot, yeah, and in a vehicle where they have to use roads, obviously, but again, they could kind of go in a multitude of different directions. That's fair. Okay. So it takes some number of police officers to set up a perimeter. Sure. Okay. Do you know how many police officers assisted in setting up the perimeter in this case? I do not. Okay. And I know, as you as you well know, some of them wrote reports, and most of the report is I helped set up the perimeter, and then the perimeter is called. Um, a perimeter is typically set up um, for, for the canine officers that are going to respond to the scene. Okay? So the, the real purpose of setting up a perimeter is to contain that area, not only to provide uh, or, or prevent a suspect from getting out of the perimeter, but also to prevent pedestrians from getting into the perimeter and contaminating the scene prior to a canine officer responding. Um, a canine officer, a lot of the time, you'll hear when they're en route to a scene that they will get on the radio and, and ensure that the scene doesn't get contaminated prior to their arrival. Um, in an effort to keep the the track for the canine as um, as as clean as possible. Okay, and I think we heard from Officer Carter and he used to refresh with the dogs of the fresh. I, yes, I'm not a canine officer, I'm, but I, that's the general theory behind that. Yes. Okay. And so this <laughs> we're not talking about setting up cop cars on the actual physical perimeter of, say, the old shopping center parking lot. We're talking broader than that, like into the Woodville neighborhood, down on Richmond Road, and over by Codell at the movie theater, stuff like that, right? Yes, and that would depend on different circumstances. Typically, a supervisor on duty will, um, and the dispatchers that can look at a map of the area, would determine where they would want their officers to uh, position themselves on a perimeter. Okay. And so NIDA, there are a lot of cop cars circulating in the area. Yes. I, that'd be fair to say. Okay. If now, not circulating, sitting on the perimeter, yes. Sure. Um, but even after the perimeter was disbanded, the information's out there that this happened, and I'm sure officers working that meet in that area are going to be working with an eye to see if anything suspicious is going on. All right. Absolutely. You, you don't just say, dag nabbit our perimeter didn't catch anybody, I guess we'll just move on and go about our morning, right? I mean, they know this happened. And, yes, sir. Okay. Now, just to talk about the videos a little bit. Um, the Danny Scott liquor video. Consigno is not identified from the Danny Scott liquor video. He is not. Okay. And the Mariana Tienda. Um, would you agree it's safe to say that there's really not a lot of any identifying information that we be taken from that video in itself, in and of itself? That when you look at that, maybe you can tell it's males, maybe you, could, you can tell race, but maybe not. Well, you can definitely tell the clothing description. You can tell the clothing description, that's right. You've got a light-colored 
shirt and a dark colored shirt, right? And perhaps you can see something out of the uh, pants, but it's hard beyond that. It is from a distance, unfortunately. And that distance, so, you know, we've seen the, the thing, this is sort of pulling down again real quick, but we're talking about a distance here. So the video is from around here in the middle of the shopping center under an overhead object. <laughs> That's we're talking about people walking out here. So we're talking about some number of yards. Yes. Distance. Okay. So identify markers like what somebody's nose looks like or you know, something like that. The video doesn't provide that. You're correct. Okay. As we mentioned, there's a lot of other video collected from everywhere. And as we said, that's in the hopes that something pops up, you know. And so you had Detective Barber go out and collect video from a lot of places, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we heard a little bit about this Thornton's video. Um, so obviously, you collected the Thornton's video because of its proximity to the crime. It's right there. But there's no camera that points backwards at Thornton's. There's not. And then, actually, when I arrived on the scene, uh, there were detectives already in the process of obtaining that video. Right. I mean, that's pretty much, that's fundamental. There's a building right there. It's a business. This happened here. Let's go see if they got video. I mean, it makes sense, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you guys, when you collect video sometimes, you don't just collect the time period that it happened. You just want all the information, right? So you actually end up collecting the time before, even up to an hour before this. Correct. For the Thorpe's video. Um, and as you testified, I don't mean to belabor it, somebody was on that video around 12.35 that fit the vague description, like you said. Yeah, there, were, there was an individual that was male black with dreadlocks, yes. Okay. And witnesses have told you that was Consigno, and then witnesses have told you that wasn't. That is correct. Well, that's correct. I mean, there were witnesses that we interviewed that uh, discussed defendant candidates uh, as being that person and then also another individual as well. Yeah, okay. Now you did collect video that had Quincy on it from the dairy. Am I right? I'm not aware of that. You're not aware of that? Okay. Uh, we can get to that. So, the dairy mart. Do you know where the dairy mart is? Maybe it's called the food. Are you talking about the Woodhill Food Mart? Maybe that's our misunderstanding. Uh, Perhaps the food mart. Could you point out where the food mart is? It is adjacent to the Danny Scott Liquor Store. Okay. So, in the same building? It is, under the same roof. Okay. That's what I'm referring to. Um, you're not aware of video collected from there that has Mr. Kim on it? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Show him and Antonio Taylor. Can ring the bell? I don't believe so, no. Okay. You already said you interviewed Antonio Taylor. I did, yes. Okay. And you know him to know the city? Yes, he indicated that he's friends with uh, his defendant candidate's younger brother primarily, but also communicates with defendant candidate. Okay. So you didn't ask him about this video very much? No, sir.
here from that interview um, in addition to the notes that I had with Officer Smith upon my arrival at the University Hospital. Sure. And, and I think that I, what you're saying here is what you're testifying to may be beyond the scope of what's on the actual report. I don't have, I don't have the trans, a transcript of that. Okay. However, when I was uh, arrived at the hospital, like I discussed yesterday, I first met with the responding officers who had already spoke with Mrs. Price, who provided a description of a medium to dark complexion. Right. And at the time, you had the wherewithal to record your conversation with them. That's correct. Okay. You routinely record conversations with victims who were in our life. Yes, sir. And tell the truth about you. Uh, just to have an accurate account of, of the conversation that can be reviewed at a later time. Um, memories aren't perfect, all right? Yes, sir. Okay. One minute and 57 seconds in, um, she talks about sitting on the bunker. She said, these guys, dark-skinned black men with dreads. And so the first time she's talking about complexion, she said, the dark-skinned black man with dreads. Do you remember her saying? Uh, I, I don't remember the exact quote. Okay. Would hearing it help refresh your record? Sure. Yes, under under those circumstances, that's how she initially provided that description. Again, that's not what she stated to Officer Smith. Later in that same interview, uh, not a whole lot later. First guy, he was darker skinned, he had on a white t-shirt. Remember that? 
And those were the two I, instances of her talking about complexion in that first interview. Right, and then later on she was very clear that the suspect in the white shirt was of a lighter complexion than the second suspect. Right, okay, I want to get to that. So but before we do, the first interview, she talks about complexion two times, and those are the two things she says. Dark skinned black man with dreads and darker skin had on a white t-shirt. Those are the two times she talks about complexion in the first interview. Now to the second interview. You're referring to um, this talk that we already heard about, about whether the second person had on a mask or something, or maybe not. Uh, maybe they didn't make it. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. So right before she says that, she's talking about the white shirt person with red pockets. Um, she says, the first guy like coming towards me, he was, I'd say, like, mm, he was fairly dark. And she says that. Okay. And that's the only time that she references complexion of the white shirt man in that area. Right? I, I don't have... I have the description that she provided me in that interview. I don't have the number of times in which she um, spoke of a description in that interview. Okay. yesterday uh, that were called in primarily to the dispatch and they were forwarded to the homicide unit. Okay. And so there was information that came in too that wasn't just an anonymous tip to dispatch that was forwarded. Now some of the tips definitely were anonymous, yes. Right. But my question was some of them were not of that character. Correct. Okay. <coughs> now um, we've heard about the cell phone, that the cell phone search warrant was um, sent to <coughs> HET uh, for the cell phone. Yes, sir. That was one of four different search warrants sent on four different <coughs> cell phone numbers for cell phone information that was Quisinio's phone, or a phone that Quisinio was using. That's correct. Okay. And you talked about meeting with Antoine Woods. That's also correct. I think we may end up talking to you about him yet again. But for now, um, some people that you meet in your line of work have what they call street names. Am I right? Yes. So you've got your, your legal name, you know, your name on the birth certificate. And some people have street name. Street name or link name that they go by, yes. Mr. Woods has one of those. Yes. And it is? Yola. Yola. All right. That's all for now. Thank you.
you were asked about um, you were asked about I guess whether or not you had a conversation with Mr. Fry. Can you make a person talk to you? Absolutely not. Can you make a person talk to you when they're represented by counsel? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, but I think you indicated that there was were there steps kind of in the work to work to attempt to talk with him? Yes, I've, I've explained that several times. I won't bore you with that again, but there were several, two prosecutor's offices and, and law enforcement uh, agencies that were trying to bring him to the table, yes. Okay, so you tried, you attempted, and he declined. Yes, ma'am. Right. And then you were also asked whether or not you took buckle swabs from him. Can you just walk up and take a buckle swab from anybody? No. The process of, of getting a buckle swab, their there probable cause has to exist for that evidence to be collected from an individual. And like I discussed yesterday with the two defendants, search warrants were applied for um, containing the probable cause necessary to collect that evidence. Um, that was reviewed and, and a search warrant was granted for for myself to go collect that from the defendants. Um, in regards to uh, Mr. Fry, um, probable cause did not, was not, 